Hello team, circuit protection devices. That will be our topic for today. Uh, so circuit protection devices, we're talking here about um, circuit breakers, MCBs, circuit breakers, fuses, uh, rewirable fuses and uh, uh, HRCs uh, and other other random types of maybe thermal overloads and that sort of stuff. Um, a little bit maybe on RCDs, although uh, the next topic um, covers RCDs in detail. So uh, this is quite a long slideshow, it's nearly 50 uh, slides. I don't wanna spend more than about an hour uh, talking about this, because I think that will get quite uh, boring for you guys. So uh, I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly. Uh, what I'll do is uh, skim through slides that we've seen before. There's a little bit of content here that's repeated from previous um, previous topics, and in particular, anything that we covered off in the last topic, which was circuit protection principles, um, stuff around tripping characteristics and that kind of thing. I will skim through that stuff pretty fast. If you need that information, you'll need to go back to the previous slideshows to find that and have a look. Or... Um, or the previous videos and have a look, or you can open the um, this this slideshow and, and uh, dig into that in detail yourself. As always, if there is anything that's confusing, um, contact me, get in touch with me, and I will uh, I will help you figure it out. Okay, so let's get straight into it then. Uh, this was from ASNZS three thousand. Paragraph 2.4.2, we covered off this in the last one. Uh, this one, paragraph 2.4.3 of ASNZS 3000 as well. Uh, we covered this one in the last video. Here we have the effects of electrical faults. So these are the sorts of things that can happen when we have electrical faults, when we have high, uh, high current faults. I'm sure you all can read that again. We covered this in the last video. Pause the video and have a, have a read of that if you need to. Okay, so moving on to the cartridge fuse. The cartridge fuse uh, has a link that consists of a fuse element totally enclosed in a cartridge made of non-flammable insulating material. Uh, the voltage and current rating will either be stamped on the ceramic case or the metal cap. Uh, these types of things are typically used in uh, inside appliances or uh, electronic circuit boards, something like that. Um, they're fairly compact. Uh, you probably, you guys have probably all seen these, they're, they're typically uh, uh, perhaps an inch, 25 millimeters long, uh, maximum uh, or smaller. And in fact, the, the sizing of these things, when you when you look at um, the markings stamped on them, they're, they're generally uh, identified by the size. They'll be 25 millimeter, 20 millimeter, stuff like that. Um, uh, I think we've used these before. We have them in our multimeters. These are the ones that we blow all the time on the uh, amp setting of our multimeters. Um, advantages of the different types there. Obviously, with the glass fuses, then you can you can typically see that it's blown. It makes it a little bit easier. With the ceramic one there, you'll have to uh, uh, test it with your multimeter, test it with your own meter to see if it's any good. Uh, the ceramic one's a little bit safer because they can contain the arc a little bit better. You may have seen before, I certainly have, that um, with the glass fuses, if you get a big current through those things, sometimes they can actually crack or um, even um, explode the glass. Although generally those things are contained within a, a, an appliance or something, so um, even if the glass cracks, it's probably not going to hurt anybody. Uh, this is a time delay fuse, so it's... Uh, it's a type of uh, glass cartridge fuse, but it has a, a little time delay in it to protect electronic equipment. Uh, not particularly common that I've come across. It probably has some specialized uses though. Okay, fuse, link, fuse links, thermal fuses. The thermal fuses often found in consumer equipment such as a coffee maker or hair dryers or transformers. 
powering small consumer electronic devices. They contain a fusible temperature sensitive alloy which holds a spring contact me mechanism normally closed. When the surrounding temperature gets too high, the alloy will melt and allows the spring contact mechanism to break the circuit. The device can be used to prevent a, a fire in a hairdryer, for example, by cutting off the power supply to the heater element when the airflow is interrupted. For example, when the blower motor stops or the air intake becomes accidentally blocked. Thermal fuses are a one-shot, non-resettable device, which may be must be replaced once they've been activated. So, uh, yeah, look, the, the details in, the, in that paragraph there. We have previously talked about uh, thermistors, thermal resistors, which kind of can act in the same sort of way. They often might have a, a thermistor buried in the motor and windings. Uh, the difference with a thermistor is that, in theory, once the temperature goes down, then the thermistor resistance will reduce again. Uh, remember that when the temperature goes up, the thermistor resistance increases which means that the circuit effectively breaks because it's, it limits the current from passing through if it goes to a very high current a uh, very high resistance then not much current can get through and therefore the essentially the circuit will stop which um, stops something from overheating this type of thing here is different because it it um it think about it as like a little blob of solder a little blob of solder holding the the contacts closed and then when the solder melts the spring pushes those contacts open. Um, and that'll mean that once that is blown, uh, it won't reset, you've got to replace it. Uh, it's a good idea, right? You know, this is this is um, the sort of thing that, pre that genuinely prevents domestic fires because people do stupid stuff with their appliances and, um, and they will uh, set things on fire if given the opportunity. The downside of it, of course, is that the, the user can't um, replace that themselves they they will then in most cases actually they'll come they'll just think oh that's now destroyed it does not work and they'll throw it away when in fact uh, it may just be a small part in there that needs to be replaced that would uh, that would fix that device which um i don't know to me maybe I've, I've grown up in a slightly different generation but to me the idea of throwing something away that actually you know does, is not that um hard to fix uh really gives me a bit of the, the heebie-jeebies. Uh, we have a, a lot more of a uh, disposable culture nowadays, even the, you know, the culture that I've grown up in is fairly disposable. Um, if you talk to people in my parents' generation, um, they hate throwing things away, but that's because uh, everything that they had was designed to be fixed because it was expensive. Uh, so a mechanical fusible link is a device consisting of two strips of metal soldered together with a fusible alloy. Fusible alloy just means the, the solder. Um, and it's designed to melt at a specific temperature, thus allowing the two pieces to separate. And there you have a, a, a picture of it. Um, when I, point, I should point that way, shouldn't I? Not towards my screen. I should point towards the slideshow as you guys can see it. Um, there, we have a picture. Uh, this concept actually, since we're talking about it, um, exists in other places as well. I've seen it, um, in particular, one place I've seen it is where we have uh, backup generators inside buildings, like typically in the basement or something like that. Um, you'll often have a, a wire that runs across the, um, uh, runs across the room. It's just stretched across the room, it's not an electric wire, just a, um, just a steel wire and in the middle of that wire it has a, a fusible link like this a, a link that's the let's say the two ends of the wire are, are soldered together uh, and then that wire will be under tension and uh, it's connected to the um, fuel source uh, the fuel fuel valve um, for the generator if that generator starts to overheat which is going to cause problems then that soldered soldered link the two wires will uh, melt the solder melts the two wires separate the spring pulls the wire and uh, and that will close the fuel valve and shut the generator down um, it's a pretty simple device right pretty simple device that um, uh, when that room gets too hot it's going to shut the generator off which is the heat source and really we're talking about the same sort of thing here pretty clever simple idea simple ideas often best aren't they because they don't require a lot of technical uh, stuff 
or equipment or expensive things. Nice and simple. Wired and fusible links. Let's have a look here. These devices are used in most electrical heating appliances and provide a safety backup when temperatures reach a dangerous level. Each unit consists of a temperature sensitive pallet holding a pair of contacts together under spring pressure. If the temperature reaches the melting point of the pallet, it melts and releases the spring. The contacts open, disconnecting the supply to the appliance. The temperature rating of each is fixed, but may but many temperatures range. Let me try that again. The temperature rating of each is fixed, but many temperature ranges may be selected within the range of 60 to 240 degrees Celsius. You cannot reset these protective devices after they've operated. Be sure the replacement is of the correct temperature setting. Uh, again, the detail is in there. If you have a look at that picture, it's pretty good actually. It's a pretty clear picture that shows us that um, we're going to have a temperature sensitive pallet. Again, this is something that will melt. Think of it as like a blob of solder. And when that melts, then the spring is going to spring away. Um, as it says here, be sure the replacement of the, is of the correct temperature setting. That is critical. This is something for us, you know, as, as electricians as opposed to normal civilians, right? People may call us and say, uh, my whatever, dryer, hair dryer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Mum might ask you, oh, the hair dryer is blown up. Can you, can you fix it? You're an electrician now. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that we're looking for, okay? Uh, as it says there, make sure you get the right temperature rating. Even more important than that, and I know what you're thinking. Don't short it out. Do not remove it and just connect the wires together. Go, look, see, it's fixed now, and it'll never blow again. Yeah, it'll never blow again, but it'll probably catch fire. So don't do that. It's very tempting, but don't don't remove the protective devices. They're there for a reason. Rewirable fuse. Okay. Rewirable. So we've talked about rewirables before, and the most important thing for us to understand about rewirable fuses is we shouldn't be using them. Um, they're no longer uh, legal, no longer legal to be used in, uh, in New Zealand. We can't put new ones in. I would assume that means that you can't buy them, although to be honest, I've never checked. Um, you may still be able to buy them from the point of view of uh, requiring replacement parts, right? Because we can store... Uh, rewire a fuse you can certainly buy uh, fuse wire you can get that at the supermarket um, you may be able to buy the um, fuse holders themselves uh, just as a replacement maintenance type thing uh, but we're not to install those new not that you should ever need to I mean you shouldn't be tempted to uh, why would you want to uh, and the reason is because they, they don't provide particularly good protection and uh, and they're not a very uh, high rupturing capacity uh, and, and of course the other reasons that are listed here which I will, I will let you read yourself uh, and look at let's have a look here at the uh, fuse characteristics of a typical of a typical rewirable fuse so remember there that this line here represents the tripping characteristic so time at specific currents then the way we read that it's a really nicely drawn little picture here if we looked at a for example that would be uh, so we've got time in seconds here on the uh, vertical axis and current in amperes on the horizontal axis so the way that we would read this is we would say that at a hundred amps there, there's our line. That's where our hundred, where, where our line crosses hundred amps. That equals, uh, well, I can see ten seconds there. That's right there, and a hundred seconds there uh, must be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, Right. So each of the vertical lines on this diagram represents between ten and hundred represents ten seconds, and then it looks like from between one and ten. They represent one second, so it's a non non-linear scale. Uh, but all we need to know is that line there. Is hitting at about 11 seconds, so at 100 amps. Oh, sorry, 100 seconds, my bad. 20 amps, 
So the first line after 10 at 20 amps, it's going to take about 100 seconds, or it says over 110. At 30 amps, that's this line here, it's going to take us a bit over 10 seconds, or close to 20, it says it over here, 18 seconds. At 40 amps, 4.2 seconds. So that's our, that's our inverse time current curve, remember? So that's telling us that, uh, in general, that inverse time current curve is telling us that as the current increases, the tripping time of our circuit breaker will go down. That is, that it will trip faster, or fuse in this case. So I, I often use the words fuse and circuit breaker interchangeably. Let's say protection device. So that the, tri the tripping or fusing time of our protection device will go down, that is it will operate more quickly as the current increases. Uh, however, in this case, so it doesn't say, I can't see anyone anywhere on here that's talk, that says what our actual fuse rating is. Uh, perhaps 20 amps because that vertical part of the line there never goes below 20. Either way, it's taking a fairly large amount of time to uh, trip under any condition. Which is not ideal at all, right? Okay, I think we'll take a pause there. As I said, uh, this one's quite a long slideshow, so I'll break it down into um, short pieces for you. Uh, first thing you need to know, though, is the first digit for the access code for this one is 9. First digit of the access code for the test is 9. All right. Thank you for your time. See you shortly.